want to welcome everybody at the Deerfoot campus and the Southwest campus and those of you watching online. This weekend does mark the beginning of Advent, a four-week season that leads the journey towards Christmas and the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And as we prepare for that celebration, we're working with a theme that we've called Beyond. Beyond the immediate, beyond what we can see with our own eyes, beyond life as we normally experience it. In fact, I'd like us to look at some of the parts of the Christmas story through the eyes of the angels. Angels who showed up to an old man, a priest, and to a young woman, an expectant mother, to her boyfriend, fiancé, to a bunch of guys out in the fields looking after sheep. Angels used to be a lot more popular in the 1990s than they are now, but I think we still wonder a little bit about them. In Bible stories surrounding the birth of Jesus, angels show up everywhere, in a worship service, in someone's house, in a dream, in a field. Sometimes it's just one, sometimes it's a choir, sometimes it's an army who have come to do battle. And when you read the stories, it turns out that angels are not really fluffy and white after all, eating cream cheese and playing harps. They're terrifying ground-shaking, blinding, tongue-tying, and they always have to introduce themselves with the same words, don't be afraid, fear not. And then quite a few people have to go and change their pants. <laughs> but is there something you're afraid of? Is there something you're afraid of? Some of us worry about keeping our jobs. Some of us worry about the economy. Some of us worry about our kids. Some of us worry about our health challenges. Some of us worry about our elderly parents. Some of us are afraid of the future or that our lives are insignificant or that we have no real purpose. What are you afraid of today? And what have God said to you? Fear not. Don't be afraid. What if you could look beyond when we say beyond, at least when I say it, I don't want to imply that the story of angels are beyond you, that it's only super spiritual people could understand something like this, <clears throat> or talking about angels is maybe only for the weak-minded who imagine things. Beyond really a simple word that talks about the unseen realm that we don't usually encounter or experience, about this unseen realm coming to us and being a part of our reality. It's the sense of something more in life, even when we can't fully articulate it. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to think about things like beyond unanswered prayer, beyond the impossible beyond what they think, beyond understanding, beyond the facade, and today, beyond the daily grind. Most of us know and experience the daily grind. The alarm goes off too early, and I immediately regret staying up far too late the night before. My good friend Caffeine helps me get out of the door to do battle on Deerfoot with everybody else. Then you arrive to the endless to-do list, the barrage of email, the long hours, endless reading material, another class, homework. You arrive home to the disaster we call supper because there's nothing actually in the fridge, followed by going to the grocery store to make sure there's something in the fridge tomorrow, dishes, tidying up, getting kids in bed, falling asleep really late at night, and another day begins. The daily grind. And what for? Promotion? Recognition? A paycheck? A vacation? Sometimes it does feel endless and pointless. Even in the Bible we read this, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Well, Merry Christmas to you too. <laughs> but is there a way to get beyond the daily grind? What could our lives look like? What could my look, life look like if we viewed it from another perspective, from the angel's perspective, from heaven's perspective? I want to read a fascinating story to you today from the book of Revelation. The word revelation simply means unveiling or going behind the scenes or pulling back the curtain to see what's really happening. In this case, to look beyond the daily grind. This is Christmas from the angel's perspective, but if I was on an airplane right now, I'd want to say to you, brace, brace, because this is going to get just a little beyond scary. If you want to get hold of a Bible that's close to you, this is going to be worth having wide open so you can read and follow along. It's the last book in the Bible. If you get to the very end, you can find your way from there. Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to start reading at the very first verse. Revelation 12, verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven. 
a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns in its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea. Because the devil has gone down to you, he's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he'd been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's command and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. As far as I know, We don't sell any nativity sets in Cornerstone Marketplace that has a dragon as an accessory. Camels, check. Donkey, check. Red dragon, eh, not so much. This is way beyond anything that we might associate with Christmas. We don't usually have a dragon standing in front of the crib waiting to eat baby Jesus. Most of us, I would guess, if you read that story at least for the first time, would think, what on earth? What's going on? Although all the guys who love video games, I think, are thinking, yes, at last, man-eating dragons, cosmic battles, Warcraft in the Bible, this is it. And the moviegoers are maybe thinking, this is Godzilla or Pacific Rim, it's going to be good. The Apostle John, who wrote this book, he actually makes use of a very well-known story in the ancient world, and he twists it, he plays with it a little bit to make it suit its purpose. His story in Revelation 12 is very like a myth story that was rattling around the ancient world from about 300 years before Jesus to at least a couple of hundred years after Jesus. It was a story that comes in a variety of forms. Perhaps the best known one was about some of the kind of Greek and Roman gods. It's about the birth of the god Apollo, His mom was Leto and his dad was Zeus. But this big dragon called Python, I guess where we get scary snakes from, he wanted to kill the little baby Apollo. But Poseidon, the god of the sea, protected him. Apollo grew up and he killed the dragon one day. End of story. John takes a story that people sort of half knew. They thought it was ridiculous, but they knew about it. And he engages the culture of the day. He makes some changes to the story, but he begins to make people think because they could understand. They were familiar with dragon stories in a way that we're not. We've got the Lion King with little Simba and his big nasty uncle Scar who's got it in for him. But it's the same story. Or Star Wars or the Lord of the Rings. They're all kind of stories between good and evil, what's going on. And really all those stories are trying to help us dig into our own story and into life's deeper story. All of those stories are helping us ask some simple questions. Who are we? Where are we? What's wrong? 
What's the solution? What time is it? We asked those questions in the episodes of Star Wars. There's a new one on December 19. Everybody's trying to figure out what it's about. And we need to actually ask those questions about our own life and about our faith journey too. Every culture's got its own kind of Star Wars story going on, even now. And if you've ever wanted to know the answer to one of those big questions, I want you to hold on tight. Because in this story, John holds on to both dimensions of the universe, the physical universe on earth where we live, and the invisible universe in heaven where God lives. And he holds them together, taking us behind the curtain, beyond the daily grind, so he could reveal or unveil what's going on. There's a lot of imagery in Revelation 12. And I want to do my best to help guide you through it to see if we can make some sense of it. The reading began with the story of a woman in the first couple of verses. She's actually referred to as a great sign. Look at the metaphors that are given for her. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars in her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she's about to give birth. She's clothed with the sun. She stands on the moon. She wears a crown made of stars. In so many ways, she's more than just any particular woman. She represents the entirety, the totality of the people of God, Israel and Mary and the church. We could start with Israel. You might remember a story in the Old Testament in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 37. Joseph, the guy with the stripy coat, he had a couple of dreams. He used to annoy his brothers and eventually they got rid of him and threw the coat away, gave it back to their dad. But in the dream we read this in Genesis 37, he told his brothers he had another dream and he said to them, listen, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me and they knew what it meant, the family. That's why they wanted rid of him, sun, moon, and stars. It represented the family of Israel and the 12 tribes. The prophet Isaiah later on would use the image of a pregnant woman to represent the people of Israel. And he would say, before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Before her pains come upon her, she delivers a son. But there's also a sense that this image of a woman is also something to do with Mary, the mother of Jesus. You probably know the story. Luke chapter 2. When they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. But this image of the woman goes beyond Mary. It goes beyond her to include us, the church. If you look down at verse 17, we read these words remarkably that are about more than just Mary or just the first followers of Jesus. In verse 17, we read the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's command and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. This woman represents the people of God through the ages, the people of Israel, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the church, the followers of Jesus, including us, including you. John's picture here in Revelation 12 is way more immersive than an IMAX experience. The next image we see is the dragon. The woman's called a great sign, but if you look in verse 3, the dragon is merely another sign. He's not so important, even if he is scary. Verse 3 says this, Then another sign appeared in heaven. Not a great one, just another one. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten crowns, and ten horns and seven crowns in his heads. And again, John is using images and dragon stories people would have known that aren't so obvious to us. We get the first part, the dragon's red because he's bloodthirsty. And he has all these heads because they represent authority. And the numbers 7 and 10 mean complete. He's a big dude. The horn represents strength. The crowns mean wealth. The dragon is strong and powerful. That's all he's telling us. And if the woman represents the people of God, the dragon represents Satan, the enemy of God's people. In fact, in verse 9, Jaws says so. He says the great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. It's a story as old as time. It goes all the way back to creation. God said to the serpent in the garden, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offsprings and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Next up comes the child. 
He's important. But he's not a sign. Did you notice it? He's not a sign. In verse 5, we read this. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And the child was snatched up to God and to his throne. He's not a sign. He's the reality all the signs are pointing to. He's Jesus, the one who was promised long ago. In fact, way back in the book of Psalms, in Psalm chapter 2, we read about that iron scepter. When David's speaking, and he says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, talking of Jesus, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them or rule them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. It does seem a little odd, at least to me, that Jesus has such a short life story in Revelation chapter 12. It's been collapsed from his birth to his ascension. The woman gives birth and the child is snatched away just like that, as though nothing happened. But it's not the only place in the Bible you read a very short story of Jesus. Paul wrote to his friend Timothy one time and made the story very short. He says this in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about Jesus. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world and taken up into glory. Not a lot of detail. Though it is a little ironic because Jesus actually did die on the cross. But the Easter celebration is that he was raised to life on the third day in the ultimate victory over the devil and over sin and over death itself. Victory comes through what seems like defeat. Well, now we've met the players. I want you to look with me at how the drama plays out because John writing his story talks about a cosmic war. The dragon tries to kill the child. After all, he knows what the birth of the child means for him. Verse 4, the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour the child the moment he was born. He wasn't successful. Neither was King Herod when he tried to kill baby Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2, we read this. When Herod realized he'd been outwitted by the magi, the wise guys who came to look and took off another way, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he'd learned from the magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping. And great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. When that didn't work out for the dragon, war broke out. War in heaven, war on earth, in both dimensions. Look at what we read, beginning in verse 7, about both dimensions. The war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. John tells us that there is an angelic victory in heaven. Satan is no match, but it's not even a fight between God and Satan when you read the story. God's army is led by the angel Michael, who is more than enough. John is telling us Satan is never God's equal or rival. He sends out the hired help to deal with it. And the battle on earth, it is won through Jesus. He's the conquering sing, king, the one who conquered death, the one who conquered sin, the one who conquered the enemy, Satan. The dragon is thrown down, dethroned. And just to make sure you know how thrown down he is, look at the verses. It's repeated that he's hurled down in verse 9, verse 10, verse 12, verse 13. He's hurled down, he's thrown out, he's bounced out by Michael, he's gone. And what's that got to do with me? Well... The battle on earth, it's a little more ongoing. It's a constant struggle. The moral choices that you and I face, the battle between good and evil, the battle between justice and injustice in our world, they all reflect this great cosmic battle. This cosmic battle is beyond what we really can see, but it's happening nevertheless, and what we can see is challenging enough for us. There's a spiritual battle we all face. 
We all face choices. We all face temptations. But we're not on the losing side. Jesus wins. One day Jesus sent out 72 of his friends to do some ministry. He was teaching them how to do ministry and where to go and what they could preach about and how they could lay hands on the sick and heal them, how they could cast out demons in his name. And they came back really excited. We read in Luke 10, the 72 returned with joy and they said to Jesus, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The cosmic story. Jesus wins. And it's that victory that leads to a huge celebration in heaven. Everybody's singing. Everybody's praising. It's why we worship here on earth too. It's why we sing too. Worship every time we gather is a celebration that Jesus wins. And when you don't feel like it, then pray that the person beside you would feel like it to lift your spirit, that we would sing the praise of our God. Jesus wins. Look at verse 10. It begins like this. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. And woe to the earth and the sea. That's us because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because that he knows his time is short. This worship song, it reveals that God's salvation and God's power and God's kingdom are very much present. The devil may claim to own these things. He may try to challenge you about it, but they belong to God alone. And it reveals to us the authority of Jesus Christ. Authority refers to God's rule. And the song reminds us that Christ rules over all in heaven. It belongs to God and is given to his son, not to Satan. But the singing in heaven, it raises some questions. Here's one I think about. Why do I struggle if the war is won? If the war is won in heaven... Why do I struggle so much on earth? You know why? Because the dragon's ticked off, that's why. His time is short. He knows the gospel. Our suffering is a sign of the realization of his defeat. He's on a last desperate rampage trying to drag you with him. The more you suffer, the more you know he loses. Look what he does. We're told in verse 9 that he's the deceiver, that great dragon hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan leading the world astray. He leads us astray. He deceives. And he accuses in verse 10, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. He's been hurled down. That's what the enemy wants to do in your life. Lead you astray. Accuse you. Because if he can destroy your hope, he can destroy your faith. So he tells you, you're not worth anything. He tells you, your mistakes are fatal. He wants you to think you have absolutely no future. It's his voice that says to you, your marriage is not worth fighting for. It's his lies telling you, you are damaged beyond repair. He's the one saying to you, you cannot break your addiction. He steals your hope in order to destroy your faith. It's a torrent of abuse. Literally, verse 15, then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away in the torrent. It is a flood of accusation and lies pouring over your life. But he doesn't get the final word. The final word belongs to God. And what does God say? He tells you that if you've ever wandered far away from him, like the prodigal son in the story of Jesus, that he still loves you, that you are still his child, that he's waiting for you to come home. He'll come running if you take one single step. God tells you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The old has gone, the new has come. It means your mistakes are not fatal. Your past doesn't define your future. You are God's child. God tells you that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. He has prepared good things, great things in advance for you to do. He has a hope and a future for you. That's what God tells you. There's one more thing that dragon's up to. 
Look at verses 13 and 17. He tries to kill and destroy. When the dragon saw that he'd been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast the testimony about Jesus. That could sound almost hopeless. Except Jesus wins. Here's the next big question then. How do we stand against him? How do we stand against this enemy when sometimes it feels so overwhelming? How do we stand? The key verse in Revelation chapter 12 is verse 11. Look at this. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. How do we press on when life presses in? We triumph by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus wins. Paul wrote to his friends and said, Who will bring any charge against God's elect, those he has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who could condemn? No one. Christ Jesus who died, but more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God interceding for us. They triumph by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus wins. And they triumph by the word of their testimony, our verbal witness. We talked a lot about that last weekend, about telling the story of Jesus, about telling my story, and how Jesus has become a part of my story, what he's done for me. Not so much what I've done, but what God has done. They triumph by the word of their testimony. And did you notice they triumph by proclaiming the gospel to the very end, not even shrinking from death. Those first followers of Jesus were quite willing to pour their hearts and their lives out for the gospel. It says they loved Jesus more than their own lives, and for many it cost their lives. And for many today around our world, it still costs their lives. What would that imply for us? sitting here in our province, in our city. At the very least, it has to mean that we choose to leverage our lives, our relationship, our time, our assets, our finances for the glory of God. After all, Jesus told us that we ought to learn to pick up our cross. Sometimes you'll hear me say here at FAC that really Jesus invites us not just to come and see, but to come and die, to die to our own agenda, to die to our own comfort, to die to our own ambitions, to die to our own priorities, that we would love him far beyond any of those things. What did Paul write to his friends? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? <laughs> Somebody's excited. I remember lying in hospital when I was in ICU three years ago and God spoke those words into my head, into my mind. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. And then he says to me, say it out loud. Do you believe it? Say it out loud. Would you say it with me? For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Martin Luther wrote a famous hymn. You may have heard of it. It's an old hymn. A mighty fortress is our God. One of the verses in the end, towards the end of it, it talks all about this looking beyond the daily grind, looking beyond what's obvious in our lives. It reads like this. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us, the prince of darkness grim. We tremble not for him, for his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word is Jesus. Jesus wins. Amen. So what is beyond the daily grind? What is the deeper story of Christmas that we learn in a story of a scary red dragon in Revelation 12? Who are we? We are the people of God. Where are we? We are right here in this battle that continues on earth. What's wrong? The enemy who's been chucked down and hurled down and kicked out, he's after us. He's after you. What's the solution? Jesus. Jesus wins. What time is it? We're right in the battle, awaiting the return the second advent of our King. And so today, I want to invite you to do something. 
the chair back in front of you, you should find a little card like this. Kind of got some snowflakes on it. It says, this is my story. I'm going to, in a moment or two, invite you to write a little part of your story down there. It says, Jesus saved me from. You could make your own story there. We'll have a song. You can be part of the song. You can sing. You can sit and listen. You can write. I'd love for you to write a little bit of your story there. And then out on Main Street, we've got some big poster boards. There's some string on them and clothes pegs there. I'd like you to post your story up so other people can read it. So we can read the stories together of what God is doing in our lives. That we would share our testimonies. That we would reach beyond because the scripture tells us that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Would you share your story with somebody today? Father, thank you that as we gather here, we do so in Jesus' name. And he is the one who wins. He always wins. The battle has already been won in heaven. And today in Jesus' name, we declare your victory in the battle here on earth. We know what it feels like sometimes. Oh, there's easy days. But we often know far too much about difficult and challenging days, wondering why we struggle so much, wondering why things have to be so complicated and difficult, wondering why there's so much heartache and grief. And we realize the enemy chases us, but in Jesus' name we win. And so we celebrate that victory, that we win by the blood of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus crucified and raised to life in the third day, ascended on high, enthroned as the King of heaven, coming to bring us back to be with himself. We win because of Jesus. And as we choose to write our stories out, we do so because we know that we triumph by the word of our testimony. We want people to know what Jesus means to us. We want to learn what it means to encourage each other by being vulnerable and putting some of our story on a piece of paper that someone else might read. But it's not only someone here at FEC might read it. We want to write our story because we want all of heaven to know what Jesus has done in our lives. We write our story because we want that dragon to know what Jesus has done in our lives. And so today we proclaim that we are yours. We don't love our lives more than we love Jesus. So at the beginning of this Advent, we choose to surrender to you. We look forward to your victory that we claim in our lives because of Jesus. And we pray in his name.